Hey there, and welcome to New Life Church. We're glad you can join us. Before the message begins, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to all our social media platforms so that you can stay informed on all our latest content and events. If you feel led to invest in the ministry, please visit our website, newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again, and God bless. Looking forward to sharing the word with us tonight. And uh, there's one verse of scripture in particular that we're going to kind of drill into. But in order to do that, we need to look at those things that surround it. So I'm going to ask you to consider with me a psalm that much of it is familiar. Some of it is not. You know, with the psalms, there are several psalms where they're quickly quotable. We, we think of them very often. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd and so on. And then there's those other psalms that don't so quickly come to mind. I want to look at one of those tonight. But the 17 verses included in it, it has a little bit of both. Some of those passages that come frequently, some not so much. But that being said tonight, we want to look at Psalm 90. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 90. The title of the message tonight very simply is A Prophet's Prayer. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, tonight, O oh God, as we look to your word, we look to your word. We don't approach the scriptures, O oh God, as just a book or a book filled with good suggestions or relics from days gone by. The writer of Hebrews said the word of God is living and active, and sharper than a two-edged sword. So God, tonight we approach your word as the living word of Almighty God. And because it's alive, the truths contained therein, O God, are timeless. As surely as the words we will consider tonight were fresh and alive and relevant hundreds and hundreds, truly thousands of years ago, they are equally fresh and alive and relevant tonight. So God, help us. Help us tonight, I pray, on either side of this microphone, God, to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us, O oh God, to attune our ears to the Holy Spirit. And help us, O oh God, as we give voice to the scriptures tonight. Lord, to have all the distractions cleared away. Because God, we want to hear what the word says. We want to receive the lessons from, Lord, the Holy Scriptures tonight. So teach us, I pray. God, now I commend this time. God, we thank you for it. We thank you in advance for the things you will teach us tonight. And God, we seal these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While I only want to share with you principally from uh, one verse of scripture here in Psalm 90, I do need to give you a little background. If I did not do that, then it's not that the verse would not make sense, but we wouldn't be able to fully unpack it or more fully unpack it if we did not look at some of the surrounding uh, texts, the context, the background, a few of those things. And uh, so we want to do that in these few moments. Perhaps, perhaps the or one of the most beloved and frequently visited books in the Word of God is the book of Psalms. Uh, we often, when people get saved and we want to encourage people toward devotions, we usually tend to go either toward the Gospels or we go toward the book of Psalms. There's something where we know there'll be an immediate uh, refreshing of their souls or immediate eye-opening. I um, don't know if in these years I've been serving God, I've heard anyone tell a brand new believer, you know, you're just starting to read a word, the Word of God right away and uh, open up Leviticus. It's going to just ignite your soul. Now, why do I pick on Leviticus? Because May is coming in a few days, and we start our ne next track reading, and we're going into Leviticus, and it will ignite your soul. But that's not generally the first thing that we tell a new believer. We point them to the Gospels where it talks about the life of Jesus, or we point them often to the Psalms. So tonight we go into the book of Psalms. Psalms, the Psalms itself really is taken from a Hebrew word. The word Psalms is not Hebrew. But the, the word Psalms, we find it in the Greek translations. We find it in Septuagint and so on. It's taken from a Hebrew word, telehim, 
which means there are several meanings, but basically it means praise song. So when we think of the Psalms, we think of a series of a collection of at least 150 songs. We don't have the melodies for them, but the label itself gives us an idea of what this is. While the book of Psalms contains 150 praise songs, the texts of the individual songs or Psalms seldom give us an indication of who wrote these books. In fact, there's only one verse in all of the book of Psalms that gives away who was the author of that particular praise song that's found in Psalm 72, verse 20. It's the exception to the rule, and it reads like this. It says, this concludes the prayers of David, the son of Jesse. So how then do we know who wrote the other Psalms? You can do some historical digging and that sort of thing, but one of the things we look at, if you look at your Bibles, in most of the Psalms is a title that the transcribers put on that for us, and usually they're pretty consistent or very similar in our Bibles. Those titles often contain very important information for us regarding the writer, and historians and theologians have dug deeply enough that there's pretty much a consistency in identifying who were the authors of the various psalms. We have to be honest enough to recognize for some of the psalms, we really don't know who the authors were. We simply know that it reflected the heart of Almighty God. And we'll look at a little bit more of that in a few moments. Various commentators have various theories regarding the authorship but these titles at the beginning of our psalms provide for us, again, some reliable and much-needed information when it talks about who composed these books. Of the 150 psalms uh, that we have recorded here, it is believed that the earliest psalm that was written was not Psalm 1. But the psalm we consider tonight is believed to be the earliest psalm that was written, that being Psalm 90. Universally, it's believed that it was written by Moses, probably dating somewhere back to around 1405 B.C. Historically, when we look at this, this simple psalm, it covers a period, it's believed to cover a period, a period of roughly 1,000 years, going back perhaps as far as 1400 B.C. during the time of Moses, and taking us all the way up then to Israel's return from exile around 450 B.C. So while we can read the Psalms very, very quickly, relatively quickly, it slows down a little bit when you get to Psalm 119. But while we can read these 150 Psalms relatively quickly, understand that what we're reading covers an entire century. It covers a thousand years. Uh, and that's impressive and that's rather expansive. In terms of subject matter, the Psalms deal with some very selected events of that aforementioned millennium, rather, not a century, a millennium. It deals with several very specific events that happened within that thousand years and provides us a little bit of a glimpse of the thoughts and the feelings, especially of those who recorded these events during that thousand years, especially their God-directed thoughts and their God-directed feelings. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every one of the thoughts or feelings represented there was necessarily God-directed. For example, you read some of the Psalms of David. When David talks about, you know, opening the ground and sucking up your enemies, and swallow them, kill them all, Lord, that's not necessarily inspired by the Holy Ghost. But you find those majestic things that are being expressed by the writers of the Psalms. They're certainly where God breathed. Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's God breathed. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's God breathed. John mentioned tonight, was that verse from Psalm you mentioned? Was that I would faint it if I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? We find that in the book of Psalms. And over and over, we find those things where somebody, some person picked up the pen of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they wrote those things that were just kind of pounding in their heart from God. The book of Psalms goes on, and it vividly displays uh, just kind of the complexities of the human experience. It talks about everything from faith to failure. It talks about delights and despair. In these 150 Psalms, it talks about prosperity, it talks about pain, 
And even in the face of great challenge, the Bible talks throughout the book of Psalms about a relentless return to the God who is, even when things are broken, when things are difficult. And we'll see that tonight in Psalm 90. Going back, the writers of the Psalms, the, the singers of the Psalms brought us back, turn, return back to the God who truly is. Now, while the Psalms are a lengthy collection of Hebrew poems, these poems, these Psalms are filled with rich theology. I know some people say, oh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about theology. That, that's, that's nonsense, folks. Theology is not a scary word. It simply talks about the study of God or us trying with our limited understanding to understand God. So when it comes to these 150 Psalms, while they're songs, and maybe we'll learn the melodies when we get to heaven, I don't know, but we can learn the theology of these Psalms now. We can learn what it was that the author of these Psalms are trying to teach us about the God who is. The Psalms deal primarily with three things. All 150 of the Psalms, they deal primarily with God. Who is God and what do we know about God? They deal with man, especially Israel in their covenant community and the individuals who made up that covenant community called Israel, the people of God, the nation of God. The third thing it deals with is the resolution of the tension between a holy God and a sinful, alienated finite people. How do you resolve that tension when man sinned against God and we severed the communion we have with God? As you go through the book of Psalms, it talks about resolving that tension. Where are the answers for it? Especially in those portions of Psalms that are prophetic. Some of them are decidedly prophetic. You can read all sorts of things about Jesus when you read the book of Psalms. So the book of Psalms is one of those things where it begins to open our eyes to how God solves the tension or resolves that tension between the holiness of God and the holy God and the sinfulness and the godlessness of unregenerate man. In the interest of outlining, in case you like to outline, let me give to you the breakdown of the 150 Psalms. No, not one at a time, but I'm going to give you the groups because uh, many, many scholars believe that the Psalms in their entirety, the 150 can be grouped into five different books, what they call five different books of the Psalms. Let me give them to you, and I promise you I'm going to do this quickly. As I was preparing to share with you tonight, at first I thought, man, we're going to have a lot of leftover time, but then I thought, well, we can be there until they start serving breakfast. So I'm going to try to carve this back a little bit for us. When it comes to the five books that constitute the book of Psalms, Book one is chapters one through 41, and that's considered the book of personal experience. And it's not that after chapter 41, none of the writers of the psalm talk about their experiences with God, but listen to just a couple of things that you have in the early part. Psalm four, verse one, answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress, be merciful to me, and hear my prayer. Psalm 5, verse 1. Be, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Psalm 6, verse 1. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. And over and over and over in this uh, first 41 verses, you see person after person, author after author, talking about their experiences in God. Hence, the first book of the Psalms, the first collective books, book is considered the book of personal experience. The second book is chapters 42 to 72, and that's called the book of Elohim. Elohim is the first name of God that we find in Scripture, in the beginning, Elohim. And it's a plural name, plural form of El, which is another name of God. And it's not talking about three different gods, but it's a name that certainly in the Old Testament is reflective of the Trinity, that God is one God made up of three persons. In the beginning, God, this plural name for God, made the heavens and the earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this idea of Elohim, the name Elohim, one of many of God's names, speaks to us of God's strength and of God's power. And you'll find in book number two, over and over and over again, it drives home the power and the strength 
of Elohim, of our God. In book number three, that's chapters, or Psalm 73 through Psalm 89. It's called the dark book. And I thought that was curious. Why in the world would there be any passage or any collective passage of scripture that's considered to be the dark passage or the dark book? And that's not because this segment of the Psalms is full of doom and gloom. But it's because when you look at Psalm 73 through 89, it takes us on a journey of the people of God, of the nation of Israel, from their exaltation and the elevation of David as king all the way through their exile. So we find the history of the, of the nation of Israel from exaltation to their backsliding and their exile. So this collection of Psalms is considered the dark book. Book number four is considered the book of the king or the book of Moses. And in that book four, which goes from Psalm 90 to Psalm 106, one of the things that's highlighted is how God would rescue his people from bondage. Certainly speaking directly of Israel, how God would rescue them from bondage, but also you find allusions to Messiah in that and the ultimate rescue from bondage in the person of the Son of God. And then there's book five. Book five is Psalm 107 to Psalm 50, and it's called the book of praise because it's filled with anthems of praise and thanksgiving. Glory to God. Those are the five books. We're going to focus on book four tonight, just one of the chapters or one of the Psalms in book four. Book four opens with verses or with, 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 with a psalm that attributes or attributed to the writing of Moses. But book four, this collection of books, the book of the king, the book of Moses, it ends with Moses being the dominant feature that we find, the dominant individual we find other than God throughout the course of these books. Book four contains themes like the brevity of life. We'll see that in a few moments. The Lord's future reign on the earth and God's creative and sustaining power. That's the background. That having been said, let's read it. Psalm 90, I want to begin at verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV tonight. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, return to the dust, O son of men. For a thousand years in your sight is like a day that is just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Verse 11, we know the power of your anger. For your wrath, I'm sorry, for your wrath is a, as great as the fear that is, is, is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have been troubled. May your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I want to go back and read one verse in particular. Look at verse 16. May your deeds be shown to your servants. And may your splendor be shown to their children. Psalm 90 is referred to as a psalm of trust. One of a handful of psalms is considered a psalm of trust. Inherent in such psalms like this, 
There are several characteristics that tend to be familiar in psalms like this. Let me share with you a couple of them. Familiar in these psalms of trust is often a declaration of the psalmist's trust in God. I trust in God. I delight in God. Inherent in these types of songs also is an invitation for others to trust in God. And it's issued mainly to the community of God. It invites believers, trust God. You can trust God. In the midst of the brokenness and the despair he talks about in Psalm 90, he invites people then still to trust in God. The third thing is often there's a statement regarding the basis of trust. Why can we trust God? Upon what can we build a trust in the living God? The fourth thing is there's always a petition, a crying out to God, a prayer, asking God for his favor or his righteousness or grace or whatever it might be. The fifth thing is often there's a vow or a promise not to ask God to provide something, but a promise to praise God. God, I will worship you. God, I will magnify your name. And then lastly, one of the characteristics of such psalms is there's often some sort of lament, some sort of repenting for sin that has taken place. The words of this brief psalm are riveting because Moses chooses to distinguish between two things, and there are two things I want us to consider tonight. First, he talks about what I call the transitory nature of human life, the short-lived. Life is temporary. Life is impermanent. He says in here that life, the span of life is 70 years, or if you have strength, it's 80. Thank God, several of us pass by that to the glory of God. And it's not telling us that, well, it's 70 years, get ready, you're about to check out. If that's the case, I got a little over a year and a half to go. And that's not what he's telling us. And he's also not saying, if you get by 70, you get 10 more at best. That's not the case. He's talking in a general sense here. But he's talking about the fact that after sin entered into mankind, man no longer was an eternal being in our own here on the earth. There is an end of our days. It's like a blade of grass. It comes and it goes, whatever number of years. So he talks about the brevity or the transitory nature of, of life in this. He begins by talking about in this. He talks about the eternality of God. Look at verses 1 and 2. He said, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the end of the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So before he talks about the brevity of our own lives, he brings the security of knowing, but God is here forever. You're God from generation to generation. Before the mountains were created, God, you were there. Long after they're gone, God, you will be there. He then moves us quickly to speak about the comparative brevity of our own lives. Look at verses 3, 5, and 6. Verse 3, he says this. You turn men back to dust, saying, return to the dust, O sons of men. Verse 5, you sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning. Though in the morning they spring up new, by evening it is dry. Now, cheer up. This really is an exciting psalm we're looking at, but... We walk through the things he's talking about. He talks about the brevity of life, the comparative shortness of our lives compared to the eternality of God. If that wasn't enough, he then announces the inescapable consequences of our own sin. Look at verse 8. You have set our iniquity before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. And then he concludes this segment with a plea. I told you that these types of psalms often have a plea. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, he says, teach us. Teach us to number our days. If our days in light of eternity are few. Now, we understand when we're born again, life doesn't end when we draw our last breath here. But he's talking about our temporal existence. And If, in fact, our days are numbered, if life can come like a vapor or like a blade of grass, Then he says, God, teach us then to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God, teach us how to walk in these days that you have us serving you. In the latter part of this psalm, we talk about the transitory nature of, of humanity. Life comes and life goes. But the other thing, in a collective sense, that the psalmist drills down on here is the compassionate nature of God. 
When you look at the last few verses, verses 13 through 17, he drives home that our God is a God of great compassion. There's an old song. It says, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And folks, that's the truth. You can search the world far and wide, and you will never find anyone who cares for you like the Lord. That did not just come with the birth of the Messiah. Way back in the Old Testament, the writer of this psalm, Moses, caught it, and he understood something about the compassionate nature of our God. So let's take a look at that for a few moments. And in a nutshell, Moses asked God to have compassion. Have compassion on us. God, you know that man is sinful. You know, God, that we have a tendency to be corrupt or to step into corruption. So he asked God to have mercy upon sinful man. He wanted him. He wanted God to balance his judgment for sin with the loyalty of his own love toward those whom he created. The Bible tells us that God loves us with an everlasting love. Where can we go from his presence? Where can he flee from his spirit? What can separate us from the love of God? And the Bible is filled with things that remind us of the eternality of God's love for us. So Moses, in writing this, appeals to God, and he says, God, give us the balance. You see our sinful condition, but I appeal to you, the God of all mercy, in your mercy, in your eternal love for us, forgive us of our sins. I can stop right there tonight and be a happy camper. I'm just so grateful to God. I'm so grateful to God that the scripture says things like man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. John 3, 17. We get real stoked about 3, 16, and we should. But don't forget the next verse. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men, given on earth among men, whereby we can be saved. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There is one baptism. One God who is all in all, and he's over us all, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So Moses makes his appeal. God, balance out your your needful direction or, or directive dealing with sin with your overwhelming compassion and save us and forgive us and cleanse us. Then we can live our lives filled with your joy and gladness. Now, all that's wonderful. But in this psalm, the one verse that really stuck out that I want to share with you tonight is verse 16. And it has to do with the prayer of Moses. By the time we get to the latter part of this psalm, Moses is praying. So let me read again verses 13 to 16. Then I want to go back and land on this one verse quickly. Relent, O Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have been troubled. May your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us, the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Look again at verse 16. He said, may your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to their children. I want to spend just a few moments with this tonight. Moses begins to pray. He begins to call upon the Lord. And he offers a prayer to God that simply is reflective of the burden that he had as a prophet of God, as a servant of God, as a leader of the nation of Israel. Moses could have really been uptight a lot of the time. You try leading tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of rebellious people out of a desert. You try standing before them. There's a river in front, a mountain on either side, a ferocious ferocious army behind them, and you tell them, fear not. All of a sudden, the ground dries up. You know the account. He gets them across. They're on the other side. They're not in the wilderness too very long before they start to complain. You brought us out here to die. We're hungry. At least we had onions and garlic back in 
in Egypt where they were beating us every day, but we at least had fresh veggies, but you brought us to die. So he appeals to God. And God gives them manna for 40 years, the Bible says, until they left there. They had this what it is or what is it is what it was called. They would be there every morning. And if that wasn't satisfying enough, God gave them meat to go along with it. They were in the desert, and when they got thirsty, on several occasions, God said, here's water. Hit this rock. I've never hit a rock in my life and had water come out of it. I've skipped rocks across the water. But God tells Moses to do something peculiar, hit the rock. And still the people rebelled over and over and over again. For 40 years, he put up with this. He sees the glory of God, unprecedented glory of God. And for 40 years, and I'll tell you how significant the rebellion was. God said, none of you are going to get out of this wilderness. You're all going to die. Your kids are going to get the blessing of God. They're going to go into the promised land, but I need to deal with this rebellion. So Moses could have been a cranky, nasty, crotchety old guy, but he wasn't. Even with those who rebelled time and again, but those who gave him such a hard time, he prayed, God, be merciful. That's the heart of a prophet. That's the heart of a true servant. And that's how he prayed for them. So a couple of things, just two things I want to share with you very quickly. Moses' prayer reflected two things. It reflected what he needed to pass by. There were some things that needed to be in his scope, in his vision, as he was praying for the nation of Israel. He said this. He said, make your deeds to be shown to your servant. Consider the elements of this prayer. He starts off with the simple fact that something needed to be seen. And that's the language of his prayer. Make your deeds to be shown to your servant. So Moses starts off praying by God, something needs to be seen. What was he talking about? Thank you for asking. Let me explain. May your deeds be shown. The word shown is equivalent to the English word to see or to be seen. We know from our own English language that there are various nuances when we use a word like see. Let me give you just four of the ways that we use the word see, a simple word like the way see. To see, I see, is simply a collection of data that comes in through my eye gate. I see the bottle of water, I see the table, I see the carpet, I see the monitor, I see the microphone, I see you, I see. So I'm simply collecting data through the eye gate. In my more exciting moments, I see. I see. Lonnie shares with me something I never understood. I see. I get it. Same words. Entirely different meaning. In my more analytical moments, hmm, I see. I understand. Or lastly, I'll see. I'll know. I want you to understand we can take simple language and the nuances of that language can present several different things. If that is true in English, how much truer is it when it comes to the Hebrew language? All manner of different things. Let me share you, for example, let me give you at least seven or eight different ways the simple word, the same Hebrew word for see, is used throughout the scripture. And there's a reason, I'm going someplace with this. In Genesis chapter 29, and I wish I had time to, to jump into this with you because I found this kind of, kind of exciting. Genesis 29, the word see meant to see. I'll just tell you real quickly. Jacob comes into the land, and he finds that he's in the land of his cousin Laban. And somewhere there comes a shepherdess, as the scripture called her. Her name was Rachel. Rachel was apparently pretty cute, at least in the eyes of Jacob. And the Bible says that when he saw her, he was just dumbfounded. He leaps off whatever he's riding. He goes over, now guys, don't do this if you just meet again. He goes over and he kisses her. And he gets all excited about Rachel. The scripture said just when he saw her. And he got so enthralled with Rachel that he begins to talk to her dad. And I want to marry your daughter, you know. And he works for seven years that he can marry Rachel. And the Bible says that when he saw her, not only did he kiss her, but the Bible says he broke down crying. This guy was... What is the word in Bambi? Twitter painted? You know, he was just out there someplace, you know. And, but all it meant was that he saw her. There was no deep understanding. He knew nothing. He just saw her, and he was just gone. So in Genesis 9, the word simply means to see. 
In Isaiah 52, the same word means to understand. In Genesis 26, the word means to verify or to confirm. In Genesis chapter 11, it means to examine or to investigate. Genesis 11, let me read this to you, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, that being the Tower of Babel, that the men were building there. He came down to see. He came down to investigate. God came down to examine what's going on down here. Same Hebrew word, the idea of investigating. Genesis chapter 41, the word means to select. Judges chapter 7, the same word means to imitate. In Judges chapter 16, the word means to discover or to find out. And then in Jeremiah chapter 5, the word means to experience. Jeremiah 5, 12, they have lied about the Lord. They said he will do nothing. No harm will come to us. We will never see, we will never experience sword or famine. So there are all sorts of words that are translated from this word see. The fact is what Moses was getting at is that there is something that the people need to see, something they need to comprehend, something they need to understand. He's talking about, he said, God, in his prayer, God, let your people see your deeds. So what's he getting at? That was the fact. Something needs to be seen. What was the focus? The focus was the deeds. God helped them to see your deeds. Why was that important? Folks, every now and then, it encourages us to see the works of God. Amen? I get thrilled. I don't want to ever live so long that when I see somebody get healed, it's like, oh, well. I get excited. When I receive answer prayer myself, when I hear about somebody else, when I see the glory of God, when we sense the presence of Almighty God, when I see God do those things that override the laws of nature that he has put in place, and every now and then, and we're in good company if we feel that way in 2023, it was the same in the New Testament time, same in the Old Testament time, same as long as there have been the people of God. Every now and then we need to see God show us, if you would, your deeds. When we come to the days of Mo Moses, the hour was critical, especially when they were in, embroiled in slavery. The hour was critical. The suffering was epic. And Moses needed to see, God, I need to see your works. I need to see your deed. But not just Moses. He said, God, your people need to see. Encourage them. Your people need to see the deeds and the works of God. Sound familiar? In 2023, God, show us your deeds. Help us to see the might of Almighty God. I'm still praying, folks, and I'm asking you to join me in prayer. That seeing the supernatural work of God not just for the work itself, but it will become never trite, never trivial, but frequent and routine. That we see the glory of God day after day after day, God doing huge things, God doing things that in our arrogance as human beings we say are impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. Amen? So every now and then, folks, I don't know about you, I want to see the deeds of God, not because I don't believe him, not because I don't trust him, but it sparks something, it renews something in our faith, and Moses knew that. There was a fact. Something needs to be seen. There was the focus. God, we need to see your deeds. There was a fulfillment. The Bible tells us it came to pass, and that leads me then to the folks. Who needs to see the deeds of God? Who? A couple people. In Egypt, Pharaoh needed to see the deeds of God. Israel was plagued with all manner of paganism and Believing in and serving gods who were not gods at all. They were made of stone or wood or clay or something that man had shaped with his own hands. Pharaoh needed to see that he was not God. Pharaoh needed to see the deeds of Almighty God. The idol worshippers, citizens of Egypt needed to see that there is God. Those who occupied what was called the promised land needed to see that there is a God. But according to Moses' word, no one needed to see this more than the people of God. He said, may your servants be shown your deeds, your people. So while all those out there needed to see it, he said, God, in-house, we need to see. We need to understand. We need to behold the works of Almighty God. 
those who have been enslaved, those who have been in bondage, those who stood between the sword of Pharaoh and the impossibility of a river standing before him, we bring it to today. Those whose lives are in jeopardy, those whose thoughts are suicidal, those whose marriages are in trouble, those who've lost their jobs, those whose kids have walked far away from God, those who are find themselves in all sorts of stress, those who have more questions about life than answers, and those who are questioning, why should I continue to live? God, we need to see the work of Almighty God. Those believers who find themselves under the, the continual assault of the enemy, God, would you encourage us again and show us your deeds, show us your works. Moses said, may your deeds be shown to your servants. So his prayer reflected what he needed to pass by. I need to pass by the place, God, where I see your deeds, where we see your deeds. We see your work once again, lastly and much more quickly. His prayers reflected what he needed to pass on because it wasn't all just about Moses. It's good for us to receive the blessings of God. It's good for us to know God. It's good for us to be in relationship with him. But Moses was not content just having his own cup filled. What do I need to pass on? What do I need to give away? One of the great lessons that we must learn is that no one lives in a vacuum. None of us. So for the person who would dare think of themselves, I'm not a person of influence. You know, nobody really knows my name. Nobody knows who I am. And my words don't mean very much. I had someone say something like that to me just last week. Well, my words don't mean much of anything, but for what it's worth, let me just tell you this. And I had to stop them and correct them. There is no such thing among the people of God. There is not. And never allow the enemy to believe that. Your life is of great value independently to God, but you must understand that you don't live in a vacuum. You don't. So your life, no matter how public or private it might seem to be, it touches and it influences other people. The things we do will always impact someone else. So understand this. When you and I walk with God, when we do his will, when we see his deeds, there emerges within us a growing desire to pass it on. Isn't that neat? When I'm growing in God, when I'm learning from God, when I'm doing my best to be a real disciple of Jesus, there's a restlessness, a positive restlessness on the inside. I'm not content just to say, bless God, I'm growing. Forget everybody else. I'm, I'm on an island growing. As it happens, as, as he does more and more work on the inside, there's just a desire to pass on, I got to tell somebody. I remember when I first got saved. Uh, you know how sometimes you do something and you're really glad? Some things. You're glad you did it before you thought it through. I got saved on a Friday night. Went to work on Saturday morning. I was out of control. I, mean, I did my job. Did my job well. But every time I had a break, I'm telling somebody, guess what happened to me last night? And I'm telling all these people about I got saved. Most of my coworkers never heard the term. They knew it by the end of the day because I drove them nuts all day long just because something inside automatically. I wasn't thinking when I got up that morning, well, I'd better witness to somebody. It was just in there. It was in there. You remember how Jeremiah said, I'm not preaching the word anymore, but he said it's like a fire that shut up in my bones. And every now and then, as we're growing in God, something inside things, I got to give it away. I got to give it away. I got to pass it on to somebody. And that's a good thing. That's a God thing that happens in our lives. Moses prayed, may your splendor, not just may your deeds be shown to your servants, but may your splendor be shown to their children. Not just this generation that sees it, but God do something for their children. May their children see the splendor of Almighty God. This was the prayer of this prophet. Now, let me explain just a little bit. What does the word splendor mean? It means several things. King James translates it as glory, and that's a good meaning. But the word splendor in its context has the idea of honor or majesty or excellence. God, don't just show your people your deeds, but let their children see your glory. Let their children see your excellence. Let their children know that you are the God who is. 
Do you get it, folks? That is a burden that the prophet had for all of the people who were there. God, let this go on to the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that and the generation after that. Caleb, I'm going to ask if you can come and get ready to lead us in a closing chorus. His prayer was, may your splendor be shown. Again, that word shown. May it be seen. May it be beheld by their children. At the top of my own list of parental dreams, personally, for me, one of my greatest dreams is that my own child will see the glory and the excellence of God. May he have his own personal encounter with the excellence and the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything as parents that we can pray that's more important than something like that. God, let our children see you. It's great if we, we bring them to church, we pray with them, we teach them the word and so on, but God, let them own it for themselves. Our kids are not going to be grandfathered into the kingdom. So God, let our children hit them. When we pray, God, stir in the children's church, folks. That's literal. That's literal. And over the last several weeks, we keep hearing testimonies about the kids just worshiping God downstairs. And that's just the neatest thing. They're getting it, folks. They're getting it. On a child's level, on a real level, our kids are understanding. And that should be the prayer, every one of us. And if we don't have children, pray for somebody else's kids or pray for your nieces and nephews or whomever else it might happen to be. But God, may our children, may they see the glory of God. May they see the excellence of God. May they see the honor and the majesty of God. Wake them up in the middle of the night. Snatch them in the workplace. Get them on the highway. Get them in school. But may they see the glory of Almighty God. Second thing, the prophet prays along those lines. But not only atop the list of our parental dreams, atop the list of our call to disciple and to mentor. Let those who see you through me see your glory. If you ever have the privilege of discipling anybody, or if you ever have the privilege of mentoring anybody, your life will influence theirs. That's biblical. That's entirely biblical but we're pointing them to Jesus. And Father, as I walk side by side with whomever it is, Lord, somehow use me in such a way that those who walk side by side with me, they might see your glory. That was the passion of Moses. And that should be the passion of every born again child of God. Whatever lives I encounter, whatever people I get to know, Whatever people with whom I get to share the name and the goodness of Jesus, Lord, somehow would you use me as a conduit of your honor and of your glory and of your excellence. And folks, God will do that. Now, for some of us, the thought might come to my mind, well, Pastor Ron, I know me, and I can really get in the way of God. Well, join the club. But does not the scripture say that God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise? And the weak thing is to confound the mighty. God chooses us with all of our brokenness, with all of our mistakes, with all of our hiccups. And God will work through us. Moses, this great servant of God, who penned the psalm we read tonight, has an encounter with God. I've never said before a non-consumed burning bush. I've never said before a bush that was consumed and burned. Moses stands there and he hears the voice of God. God reveals to him who he is. And Moses starts to give him an excuse. Oh, I, I don't talk well. Well, God, I, I, I can't do this and so on. Read the scriptures. He ticked God off. God says, well, take Aaron with you. And he goes on and on. And the Bible tells us God got really irritated with Moses. And I don't know that Moses' heart was corrupt. I don't believe it was. Moses simply knew Moses. You're asking me to go to Pharaoh. And give him a message from you. What are the people, what, what am I going to say? Who am I going to say sent me? I am that I am. What do I tell them? Tell them I am has sent you. Why are they going to believe me? Pick up the staff. Throw it down and watch what I will do. And I'm going to use you to do great and mighty and marvelous things. I know your weakness. By the way, I made you. But I know what I can do through you. And he says the same thing to every single one of us who walks with him. I know you. I know your frame. I made you. 
but I can do great and mighty and marvelous things through you. Folks, that was the prayer of the prophet. That was the whispering of the heart of a servant of God in the presence of Almighty God. May that be the heart. May that be the heart of New Life Church. God, may your servants see your deeds. And may our children see the splendor of the Lord. Ours. And everyone who was with us on live stream, every visitor who comes, every person thinking about making New Life their church home, whatever it is, God, show us your deeds. Refresh us once again. Show us the power of your might. Show yourself strong and mighty on the behalf of the children of men. While you're doing that for us, Father, would you do something special for our kids? May our kids see the splendor and the excellence and the glory of Almighty God. It's about more than buildings and programs. It's about bringing people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the prayer of the prophet. And that's our prayer tonight.